We're ready. We're a little late for these computers again. You know, I hope you are more patient than I am. Because this is really something that, like I was telling him that, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, okay, Brother Juan, we have, how, how are we with the, with the students and the videos? Are we ready to show them or? Uh, no, we have two students are presenting today, but one, uh, one asked special permission, the other one wasn't able to upload it at the moment. She didn't, she or she didn't upload it? No, she had issues, so he's helping me um, solve the issue. Okay. Well, that's part of the, the thing that we need to um, talk about a little. You know, again, with, with technology, you need uh, to take the time before to practice or to submit something, because even, even when you have enough time, like here, something happens. So, but if that's the reason, you know, if, if it is the technical thing that is not working, uh, you are free of blame. But if you're doing it the last minute, the last second, uh, that shouldn't be the case, okay? Because um, that's, that tells you that, like in some cases, people and names that I don't want to remember, pastors and preachers that I don't want to remember, they, they didn't prepare their sermon, they are in trouble when they are here in front of everyone. So let's go to the Lord and then we'll continue our class and check later if we had we have one video uploaded or not. Okay? Let's go to the Lord, guys. Father, we give you thanks for Jesus our Lord. Father, he is everything for us in your love. He is your love to us toward us are so many things that you have given us through him. Thank you, Lord. There, there's no enough time to tell you how grateful we are for everything that you have accomplished, for everything you have promised, everything you have done already, and everything that you have promised to do in the future for us. Your word says, Lord, that we cannot even imagine what you have provided for us. For that, we give you thanks. For that, we want to be happy, even if we are going through difficult situations while here on earth. Through sickness, or poverty, or suffering, or any other bad thing, Lord. We give you thanks because your promises are our, are our hope, and we trust you. We want to be confident that you are the one, uh, the one who, when he gives his word, he keeps it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Right, guys, we are about to finish our discussion on the importance of Jesus for systematic theology. We just uh, went through difficult uh, areas, I, I suppose, for some of us when thinking in terms of Jesus as being critical. Let me see if I can advance this quickly here. Uh, we talk about bibliology, we talk about theology proper, we talk about Christology proper, pneumatology, angeliology, amartiology, and then um, we had some, um, some areas of uh, systematic theology that are not here. At the beginning, I thought, you know, this would be a good time for an exercise and ask you questions about how do you think Christology is central for the other areas of systematic theology, like soteriology, ecclesiology, and eschatology. 
you know, with soteriology, for example, we started last time our discussion about what salvation is. Um, for some reason, I got the impression that a lot of believers in our churches still believe that salvation has to do only or mainly with the forgiveness of sins. And that's it. You see, uh, to that we react saying, you know, the forgiveness of sin is important, it's indispensable, it's something uh, essential to salvation, but it's not everything. Salvation includes so many other areas, and salvation has to do with something uh, more intimate that God telling you, okay, you're forgiven, but stay right there where you are, you know? I don't, wanna, I don't want you to get closer. And okay, you, you're forgiven. Forget about what you did to me. Forget about what you did to you or to other humans. Um, but stay right there. I wonder sometimes if God would be just like some of us, that we want to have our own space. You know, stay there. You know, I can, I can stand you for an hour probably as I preach or as I say hello. But after that, you know, I need to run to my home and get isolated from everyone, you know, just stay there. Probably sometimes not thinking in anything. Imagine God being like that. We are thankful that he is not human in that regard. That he won us though, close. So close enough that he has been willing to share his own being with us. His spirit, his son, well, according to, to John, the Gospel of John, it is the whole Trinity that he leaves, that indwells us, you know. And so, when is it? You know, I have seen those signs in Facebook or in other areas, you know. The, uh, character is what you do when no one is watching you. And I got to respond to that. When is that for a Christian? When is that for a Christian? You know? No, God is always with you and he's always there. There, there. there is no time for you to say no one is watching. No one is feeling. According to the scripture, by the way, uh, that God lives in you, you know, Jesus lives in you, his spirit lives in you, uh, means that he is also... Um, able to feel what you are feeling, what you are doing. And that's the argument of the Apostle Paul when he talks, for example, in Corinthians and encourages not to, you know, get together or fuse yourself with a uh, um, bad woman. Say, I don't know how do you say, you know, without using the, the wrong word. Harlot is not a bad word, is it? Harlot's not so bad. Okay. <laughs> you never know in English, you know, and also in Spanish is risky because I, I, you know, Mano, Mano Luis, Mano Victor go with me to the same church in Spanish and also Chin Chin is there, but in, you know, Lamar Baptist Church during these days. And of course, uh, Luis is from Mexico, but not from the same part of Victor. And, and I'm from El Salvador. I'm not Mexican. You know, I love these guys, but I'm not Mexican. <laughs> and so uh, Victor's wife is from Chile. You know, and every time we talk in public, we need to be very careful. Sometimes the words we use, even if they are not bad for you, sometimes, uh, you know, gestures sometimes, gestures that we make. I don't know, and there's a, there's a Brazilian friend, uh, brother here. Sometimes uh, uh, a Brazilian uh, brother almost told, told me, don't do that gesture because that's offensive. You know, and I didn't know which one was it. But he may, you know, he's laughing already because it's kind of dangerous. And in English, he's hearing words sometimes. It's there for me. But sometimes there are words that I cannot pronounce correctly, for example. For example, I normally say piece of paper instead of the other word that it begins with S. I don't want to say that word because I can mispronounce it. And then you are, 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, there are all kinds of, uh, all, I go around with English, I go around sometimes trying not to use certain words because they are tricky. You can get in touch. And so if you feel, uh, if you, whatever you feel, wherever you make you feel others, according to the scripture affects God, you know? You know, so Paul says, you know, don't do this because you, you don't want to get the spirit to get in this sad, you know, you don't want to sadden your, the spirit. What kind of relationship is that, that he really leaves with us in that intimate relationship? Oh, my goodness. And then it comes, of course, in English, you know, just to continue with my English here, you know, those tricky words that you have, your English speakers have, that we have, you know, Spanish does not have officially does not have the sound of s -ish. Some of our nations in Latin America can, can pronounce the sound s -ish because they've been in contact with native, uh, with, uh, pre you know, those uh, Indians, that they have that, they do have that sound. In Guatemala, for example, the x is pronounced like s -ish. You know, you say, Shela, Shela, Shelahu is the name of a, of a city in Guatemala, of a region in Guatemala, pre-Columbian native Indians. But in Spanish, the sound S H does not exist. So the only sound that exists in Spanish is C H. C H. And so when you're learning English, they tell you, uh, careful because cheap is different from sheep you see and for you it's so natural or not sheep but what is the difference between sheep sheep and sheep did you did you hear the the difference huh? what is the difference between boat unexpensive and price you know the the chips <laughs> What is it different, you know, in terms of language? This is kind of complicated. And so every time, for those of us who have learned English as, as grown-ups, I need to be thinking. You need to put your, your mouth this way. You need to do the shh, shh sounds. Because otherwise it will, it will sound ch, ch. And you don't want that, do you? Chip. Can I share something really quick? Sure. <laughs> because same issue, I learned English being an adult, or I was 16, 17. Mm -hmm. And so what happens at home is that my wife being an American or native, and my kids being born and raised here, they make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> when the pronunciation is not going so well. I've always avoided I've always avoided words like, uh, like the beach. You know, right, that's the other one. You don't use, you don't, <laughs> no, hey, don't say that word. Come on. Well, you know, I make sure it's <laughs> so you don't get in trouble. Right. I don't use that. I say ocean. The shore. The shore. The shore. Right, I am not, that's their problem. They need to, <laughs> but I'm not going to get in problem with that word, you know? La playa, which is something that they understand. Sure. Yeah, the shore. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's incredible. And you feel like, wow. So it's, um, it's something very uh, interesting, the way you, languages, you know, I, I know that some of you know that some languages are difficult because of the intonation. How you, I don't know how to do it. How do, how do they do it? It's just the way you uh, put the tone into the word. If you do it in one tone, it would be something different. And then if you are mad, imagine, imagine that you are angry at something. And you want to say that word, but you don't want to be that angry when saying that something. You will say it in that, I don't know. It's really crazy. I mean, you have to be a native in order to 
really master that type of things. I told you about the time I asked the young lady down in Mexico how old she was and used for all That was embarrassing. Right, right. And you have in English, you know, be careful if you ask a lady, tiene, tiene hombre, tiene hombre, instead of saying tiene hambre. You know, are you hungry or do you have a man? <laughs> <laughs> like you're trying to do something here. You're not ban something bad here. I don't know why we're talking about this, but you know. Exactly. So, you know, your native English speakers don't know how difficult your vowels are, and even sometimes. You even sometimes you don't know how to pronounce a word. You know, I, I ask all the time, how do you pronounce this? I don't know. You know, you just say, and I try to imitate most of the time. Amen, for example, is a word that no one pronounces the same. Sometimes you say amen, sometimes you say amen. You know, sometimes it's it's just it's crazy. So uh, I guess we're lost. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys uh, so let's talk about jesus again in terms of the centrality of jesus for soteriology for example if salvation is not just about the forgiveness of sin which he will provide through jesus of course and we know that salvation comes through jesus only and there's no salvation but through him but you know, through his cross, through his life, through his own being, what else has to do with him being who he is uh, that is so essential for salvation? His own being, the way he is. He, you know, when, when we talk, for example, about he being the mediator, normally we think in terms of what he has done or what he did, or what he is doing right now, interceding for us. But honestly, when you read deeply into the whole testimony of the scriptures, you will find that it's actually him. It is who he is, beyond what he does. It is in him that the mediation takes place. Because if it is true that in him, God, the deity resides and humanity resides in one single person. It is in him that the complete mediation has taken place. It is because of him that we have this connection between humanity and the deity. He is, and this is a type of mediation that no one else, this is my fight with Roman Catholics, you know, when they tell you that Mary can be uh, another mediatrix, like they call her, mediadora, or comediadora, mediatrix. She, she cannot do this. The only one in whom the deity exists, resides, the fullness of God is, and the fullness of, of humanity is, is in Jesus. And so soteriologically speaking, this is where salvation takes place, 100%. Salvation has to do with sharing, with participation. God communicates himself, God share with humanity his own being. God is together with us, God with us, living with us, in us, sharing his own nature as mysterious as that sound, and we, we don't want to go to the extreme, of course, of the Mormons to believe that we are, or to Kash Luna, you know, who said that we are little Yahweh. We are little Yahweh, he says. You know, horrible. He, I know where he's going. He, he sounds more like a Mormon. But there is, in fact, something of that, not going to that extreme, when Peter says that he, through Jesus, has uh, made us participants of the, not, of the divine nature, he says. That is salvation. Salvation has to do with many things, but in essence, 
It has to do with regeneration, making you a new, a new creature, giving you something that, is, that belongs to God, according to John 1. Remember that. So we have been conceived, is the word that uh, John uses here in English, but of course in, in, in Greek, and closer to the way we say it in Spanish, it has to do with engendrar, he, to engender, to, you know, like taking the image of a human father when he, when he engenders, would you say, guys? Or am I using here the wrong word in English? You know, when, when he conceives, because for us, conceiving has to do more with the woman. The woman conceives uh, a baby. You know, how, wh how would you call the, the work of the men when um, procreating um, a baby? Procreating, you know, what? To beget. To beget. Well, that's exactly the word that is there. You know, those who are being uh, procreated or be begetting by God, according to John 1 1, you know. Those who are not, what's the word that is used in John 1 in the, in the authorized translation? What, what is it that you have there in John 1? In John 1? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. When, when, I think it's 18. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. This the only God. It's isn't it? Yeah, no, but I'm talking about when he says, I think it's 12 or something. Where he says uh, that those who have been born of God, well, that's the way I think they put it. Born of God? Uh, born not of blood, nor of the yeah, but, well, you see, that's a little misleading because it's not about just you being born already. It's about what is, the, what is needed for you to be conceived, to be begotten in that sense. Uh, this is, at the end of the day, the, I, I, I would say, you know, even if salvation may include several other things, justification, the forgiveness of sin, sanctification, glorification, all those other areas that are included in salvation are basic, important, necessary, but the essence, at the end of the day, again, is that, that you are a new, a new being. Because God has begotten you by putting inside you. That's exactly the, you know, the continuation of that thought comes later on when Jesus tells Nicodemus, you need to be born again. And you need to be born from heaven, from above. Exactly. And to do that, you need Jesus. That's why we need Jesus. He has to be one of us so that God can do that to us through his, through his spirit and the spirit of Christ. So central is Jesus for that, that uh, we can keep talking about the centrality of Jesus, of course. So uh, for soteriology, Jesus is needed. And, and again, I think I mentioned the other day, uh, two or three classes ago, that we have a historical issue here that we need to discuss. Some systematicians completely forget about this um, soteriology um, issue in the scriptures. You know, if Jesus Christ um, is needed for us to be regenerated, for us to be new beings, what was the salvation that the Old Testament saints had? Were they saved in a fully sense like we are? Was there regeneration in the Old Testament as we have it in the New? And so far, the only actually, and he has been criticized for that, the only systematic theologian that I have found has dealt with the issue and has taken a position with that is, uh, is Lewis Sperry Chafer. You know, he believes, he used to believe, of course, that regeneration is a doctrine 
in a reality of the New Testament only. The saints of the Old Testament, even though they were saved, they were saved in promise. They were saved, you know, not in the, in the, in the same sense that we are right now because we already have access to this regeneration thing that they couldn't have yet at the time. Wow. Most reformed theologians completely over, you know, oversee it. They don't want to deal with that. Again, uh, I guess they have the implication is, well, if they had already the same thing that we have here, and, and in order for us to have it, we need Jesus incarnated. We need the second person incarnated. Um, and if they already have it there. So the incarnation is not really essential. You see? Even if there are some problems, of course, you know, the criticism for this position of Chafer, uh, again, it has to do with, what are, you, what are you telling me? You tell me that Abraham was not safe in the same way we are? You tell me that Moses was not safe the same way we are? Are you telling me that, you know, but because they were believers, they were good believers, they were real believers. But that forgets, I think, the promise dimension of the Old Testament. Something at the essence of the Old Testament is always, we're not there yet. We still have some promise that needs to be. The laws are not in our hearts yet. I will write your I will write my law in your heart is not a reality yet, even if it is his his word. Yes, Jim. So Dr. Alfaro, uh, how would we explain uh this is the thing we have discussed now, not in theological terms, but in a simple layman term for them to understand how were the uh, people in the Old Testament saved before Jesus came? Right. I mentioned the other day, Jin Jin, and for the rest of you, the, the reading of this chapter in uh, Charles Ryrie's book, Dispensation of Today, written in the 60s, comparing uh, dispensational, dispens dispensationalism today the name of the book he has a book there he has a chapter there where he explains easily i think still for me the best explanation for that question you know reformed theologians will tell you very easy well they were saved by looking to the future for the work that jesus will do and so the only difference is that they were seeing to the future. So they trusted God and they trusted that there were, a Messiah was coming and that the Messiah was going to save them. That's sometimes. And so the difference is they look into the future, we're looking to the past. You know? Uh, that's, not, that's not convincing. Let me tell you why in a moment. Yes, sir. But the argument, the discussion in Hebrews chapter 11, where they were looking for a, a city builder and founders. Right. Right. They, of course, there is a promise in the old, there, there are promises in the Old Testament. What is not convincing to me, according to the new, the Old Testament per se, is that everyone in the Old Testament was able to see uh, clearly that the Messiah was going to die instead of them, you know, in, in their behalf. That is not clear. That's not something. Of course, I tell you, I have told you several times already that there might be exceptions to that rule that we don't have enough data in the scripture to go deep and tell you exactly how much they knew. But in general, the people, and even those who just read the, the, the Torah, the, the Old Testament, I don't believe they really had an idea, a clear idea of how the Messiah was going to be hey, There was a mystery. And so with Abraham, there might be something special. Jesus told us. 
with David, there might be something there that we don't understand completely. But with everyone else, uh, you know, uh, historians, for example, tell us that at the time of Jesus, the expectation of the Messiah for everyone, they had different expectations of the Messiah. You know, there were some who believed that there were two Messiahs, one priest and one uh, king. There were others who believed that it was only one. But the thing they didn't expect at all, there's no trace in historical, you know, documentation. But that was the case that someone was believing already, okay, the Messiah is coming and he will die for, for me and for the nation. See? Um, and so that's a little complicated, isn't it? So is this where, uh, like, N.T. Wright is kind of his position for the new perspective of Paul and the whole idea of, like, having two different covenants right. of salvation? Right. The book that you are about to read makes a big deal out of this. And I think he is right in this particular concern. Now, I'm not talking about his idea of Pauline studies. I, you know, I don't want to touch on that. I'm not a, I haven't read enough in that area. I know the basic of the discussion, but in the area that I have read, anti right Christology, Jesus, the historical Jesus, the way they, way, they, they, they were waiting for the Messiah, the, ex, the messianic expectations, his expertise in terms of whom run intertestamental literature, how they expected the Messiah to be. I think everything is, makes sense. No one, no one understood uh, that the Messiah will die in the way that the New Testament tell us later on. And that makes sense, again, once again, historically, because that's the reason they rejected him. Whenever the disciples didn't get it, when, whenever Jesus started talking about dying, dying for them, they were completely lost. You know, it's, it's like sometimes uh, the, the, the 12 disciples uh, look to me just exactly like some believers that you're talking to them and telling them certain things and then emphasizing certain things and telling me as clearly as possible as you can in terms of, and then they completely don't know what, you know, after spending three years with them. And this is not, you know, most scholars uh, sometimes give the impression that Jesus started to talk about his death only in the second half of his ministry. But that's not true. If you read Matthew, you read Mark, you will see Jesus, uh, inviting them to reflect and suggesting his suffering and his death very, very early. Uh, and they didn't get it. Even at the cross, you know why they, they get all confused and they go away from Jesus. They didn't get it. Why? That's the reason why not this interpretation of, okay, yeah, they were waiting for the Messiah to die for them. And so the only difference is they were looking to the future or looking to the past. That is not realistic. It is not, it's, I think it's anachronistically, it's anachronistic. Um, so how? How? You know, be careful because uh, it is not a matter of having another way of salvation. If you say, well, they, they, they have some, a, you know, another way of saving themselves. What's the problem with that? Um, something very interesting that I mentioned several times in some of my classes is reading the book by um, the professor that was here related to <clears throat> intelligent design. <clears throat> Demsky. Right. I have, I have mentioned that several times. Uh, his book has to do with uh, his defense of the old earth, you know, thing. and he, he is a conservative and he is, a, he is a, a, a scholar in that area and also a scholar in theology. He's a theologian and he is also, a, a, he has a degree, a PhD in science. So 
he is convinced that science is not telling us a lie when it's when it says that the earth is old you know i was seeing the other uh yesterday I was seeing a, a video by dr Mueller on that on that particular issue with all due respect dr Mueller. i don't agree with you um i agree more with with Dembski. i think i think the problem however that many um theologians mention is is the issue of sinning connect connected with death you know and so if there was an era of dinosaurs for example or any other creatures before before adam and eve and you know they died then how do you connect that with the fact that the scripture tells you that is the death of i mean it's the sinning of adam that produced the entrance of sin and death how do you connect that i'm not going to give you the answer here. you go and read Dembski, how he deals with the, the thing uh, it is useful for understanding this issue of salvation because according to him there's a connection if we are we don't have any problem with projecting the salvific this is an essence the answer you know but i'm not going to give you the details if we don't have any problems with projecting backwards the salvific effects of the cross of jesus you know why is it that we have problems with projecting back back the destructive effects of satan's satan's sin uh, of Adam's sin. Do you get it? I understand it, but so, I don't agree with it. Ah, fine. That's fine. But the argument is there. You know, that's a theological argument. I had a class when he was here. We had that discussion. Right. Yeah. Uh, and he's a good writer. I'm not sure how good he is in terms of communicating himself. I saw him several times. And I, I enjoy him as, as a writer. Um, but his personality is different. You know, it's this more quiet, more introvert, I think. Very much so. And so for that reason, uh, in a culture like this, guys, and it's not just like this. I think there is worldwide, it's a culture of the debate. The one who is able to talk better. The one, the one who is able to, you know, make the congregation rise and that kind of thing. And, and sometimes it's based on that. You know, right now in, in, in here in Texas, it's about the debates between... The politicians? Yes. Cruz and, and O'Rourke? Cruz and the other. <laughs> and I wonder, you know, okay, yeah, right. You know, debates are fine, but honestly, are we going to make it depend on the ability to convince thoroughly? Or do we need to read and analyze more serious thought that one you can get in an emotional moment. See what I'm saying? And the same thing is, is, is in Latin America. When Obama was here again, for example, he said, I, when he won the presidency, he said, this is the win of oratory. That's dangerous, isn't it? See, if you are able to speak really good, you know, you can convince everyone. Well, the other may have better ideas. It can write them down, probably much better, but you're judging just for the debate and the abilities to, you know, to speak. Huh, that's not very promising. So relax. Um, if you're not a very good speaker, you can be a great writer. By the way, that was the case with uh, that was the case with several theologians, beginning with the Apostle Paul. You know, Aquinas, you know how Aquinas was called by his classmates. 
dumb ox. The dumb ox. How, uh, the dumb ox. It was called the dumb ox in uh, Albert the Great, who was his professor of philosophy, you know, told them, careful with that ox. I know that his, how would you say, mugidos, mugidos, uh, the sound of the ox when, how do you call that in English, guy? Tell me the word, the onomatopoeic word here. You know, like, uh, Brain. How do you? Okay, booing then. He's careful with that ox. His booing is going to be heard in the whole earth. That's true. No one knows much about the classmates of Thomas Aguinas. But if Thomas Aguinas is still living in and kicking, like you say, huh? living and kicking his, his writings at least. Okay, um, so read more carefully that section. I think the essence, the essence of that chapter has to do with God applying to those what he knew already was going to take place. And they were supposed to respond to what God has told them concerning the sacrifices, trusting the word of God uh, about the sacrifices they didn't need the, or they didn't have the special knowledge of the Messiah dying for us. God knew it, but God was able to apply to them the salvific, you know, effects of Jesus' cross to them. Um, <clears throat> so there's a difference there between the object of faith and the seeding of faith. You, you, can, you can read that. It's not a long chapter. I think it's one of the most at least for me, um, substantive. Ryrie, Ryrie's, uh, Charles Ryrie's dispensationalism today, and today was the 60s. Imagine. He was fighting against Reformed theologians at the end, uh, you know, at that time already. You know, he's fighting against this idea of making all flat, having all things at the same level, you know, everything is about the same, you know, the way you save in the, in the Old Testament, the way you save here is the future and past, that kind of thing. I said, no, 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 wait a minute. Let's be more honest about what we have in the scripture. They didn't know. Most of them didn't know about Jesus, you know, coming and dying the way he did. But they were saved uh, because God applied to them the salvific effects. Remember what we mentioned last class. We don't know exactly how God relates to history. Is he able to do that? Huh? Even if for us something has not happened yet, God is seeing the whole thing. Wow, that's something that I'm not able to grasp. That is something that is completely beyond my imagination and my understanding. No way to get it. But gladly I don't have to get it. Gladly, he is the only one who is able to. And so how that connect, that kind of thing connects. There are other ways of solving the problem of all earth, and you know that. But at the end, at least for me, they are not convincing either. But so yes, sir. Um, the, the issue between um, the non-dispensational, so the covenantalist and the dispensational regarding the way of salvation in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, another book that they could find, um, it's Robert Saucy's uh, The Case of Progressive Dispensationalism. There's an overview of both uh, sides in the case of salvation in the first chapter. It's called The Crucial Issue Between Dispensationalism and non dispensationalism Right. Uh, so. Yeah, Dr. Saucy's died, uh, I guess, Two years ago. The title of the book was "The Case for Progressive Dispensationalism." Yes. Uh, dispensationalism and non-dispensational theology. Mm -hmm. Nice book, biblical theology, more than systematic, but solid. Um, so the whole thing is how essential is Jesus for soteriology? 
central, not just because of the cross. The cross is essential, is central, but something else takes place at the incarnation. And you should know that there are two schools, of course, there are schools that most, of, most evangelicals are more related to, that emphasize more the cross. You know, the other school of Christianity that is related with, of course, Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy uh, emphasize more the birth of the Messiah. In the birth of the Messiah, something takes place, beginning the salvation of us. When God unites himself with us, you know, and so... Uh, it is easy for us to say, no, the incarnation has nothing to do with my salvation. Careful. See? Um, or you say, just the cross is the place where he paid for me. Sure, but salvation is more than paying for your sins. See what I'm saying? No, no neglect of the incarnation. No neglect of the life of Jesus. Because as I, may, I have mentioned some uh, other occasions, sometimes for some evangelicals, not for you, not for me, for some evangelicals, what is important about, G important about Jesus is his cross, period. It, it, it would be kind of the same if he would have appeared five minutes before the crucifixion and said, hey, here I am, crucify me in, 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 on behalf of them, you know? And that's it, perfect. No, there's something more going on here. The life of Jesus is important for my salvation. Yes, it is, even if in a different way. You know, uh, the incarnation per se is central. Something is going on here that is already important, essential for my salvation. And that uni unification and that Unity between God and humanity, salvation starts. And so I don't have to choose. I don't think I have to choose between incarnation and cross. I want to keep them together, as the scripture does. One of the, one of the excuses that some theologians have for isolating sometimes just the cross is that when you read the traditional um, councils or definitions, uh, doctrine, sometimes, most of the times, those definitions do not tell you much about the life of Jesus. You know? But it's interesting. Those definitions do tell you about the virgin birth. That's why I don't agree with certain New Testament scholars, like some of the friends that we have talking about when they say, the virgin birth is not that important, you know? Um, by the way, I have, and I'm afraid again here to show you, there, there are two books that I wanted to show you at the very beginning, and I forgot to, can I do that uh, right now? I'm going to give you the, 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 in a moment, just let me, let me see if I can do it. There are two books that you should, let me see if I can, Sharing whatever you're sharing. Is sharing my yeah. my desktop? Yes. Okay, here is here are the two. Are you able to see this this two? Yeah, are you able to see them there in the or not? Uh, no, you have to hit share. For them? Yeah. Well you see them guys, I would recommend these two books for you to start reading about the birth. Of our Lord, you know, one is this classical by Graham Maschen, classical coming from a professor of uh, Princeton first, and then Westminster later, uh, the Virgin Birth of our of Christ, and then uh, this is a more this is a more historical, systematic work. Should be should be read by any, uh, by, you know, any uh, serious student of Christology. 
And the other one is a Roman Catholic or was a Roman Catholic. Both both guys are not longer with us. Mashen e Raymond Brown, one of the best New Testament scholars, Roman Catholic. He has um, this book and he will also have a two volume set for the, the death of the Messiah. This birth of the Messiah, Raymond Brown here, deals with the infancy narrative, narratives, deals with the exegetical. This book is more exegetical than any other. And I, and I recommend, you know, all the, the explanations that he have for the genealogies, for example, of Jesus. Now that is important. And some of the things we completely miss sometimes because we don't know much of the context of how genealogies were used. Machen, on the other hand, is more systematic and historical. He has a couple of chapters related to how the old church, by old church here, he, he means uh, second century church, early third century, and how the virgin birth was essential for them and something something basic for the faith of the early church it was according to him it was part of what it was required for those who were about to baptize so you were not supposed to be baptized if you didn't confess that jesus was born of a virgin for example someone tells me again this is not very important, and you shouldn't pay much attention to this. Gonna give me the whoop, give me the how do you say? Give me the goosebumps. Uh, careful. Need to be a little bit more uh, inclusive. So again, you were about to tell me. Yeah, I was about to ask. Uh, as you were talking about this, uh, we must uh, not stress just only the cross. Uh, I was. Uh, forming a picture in my mind, just make sure that it is correct. That uh, there is uh, the cross and some parts of the cross that are very expressive today from, from addressing by some theologians. They are enough to take us from hell, but salvation, the part lead us to heaven. It is more broad, is that what you're talking about? Let me see if I understood you. You, you know, I may have not understood exactly what your concern there is. Is it concerned with the the cross being the essential part for? Yeah, I heard, I, I heard that from uh, Dr. Sproul once, one of his lectures, and mm -hmm. he said that uh, the salvation is more than take us from heaven, from hell, sorry, mm -hmm. but lead us to heaven also. Right. So uh, when you talk about the, about the vision birth and the life of Christ, is that included in this part? Right. Not take us right. from hell, but also leading us from, to heaven. Right. I would say that um, I'm against this, and I don't want to be harsh on this. Because uh, sometimes I, I got the impression of being mad about certain things. You know, I don't want to be impressed. Uh, I wanna, don't want to cause that impression. But I, I don't like most of my theology, most of, most of the context from I got my theology as being professor from the U.S. And I'm happy about that. But there are certain things that I don't like about that um, herencia, how do you say, that inheritance. It's the, it's the tendency, the inclination to make all the time clear cut uh, compartments about theological things without seeing the interconnections that everything in life and in a scripture has. I'm not saying that everyone in the, in the Anglo world is like that. I'm saying that there is a big, even if, you know, there's a big 
tendency and leaning it, at least the way I, I've been in touch with for several decades, to treat this out of the need of clarity, they want sometimes to have this clear cut compartments for everything. Dispensational theology is not outside that. You know, they, some, some, at least some currents in them, they want to have it this way, this way, and this way. Okay, this is it. This is, you know, this is the, uh, the age of innocence. This is the age of love. This is the age of grace. This is the age of the millennium. Like, there is no connection in between. That's why progressive dispensational is much better than other versions because they find certain currents that are connecting the whole thing. Life is not like that. Life is more like this. Interconnection, uh, overlapping, uh, organic unity, with emphasis in some respects. When coming to the life of Jesus, you shouldn't say, what is more important? The life of Jesus or the cross of Jesus, for example. What kind of question is that? What kind of option is this? You don't want just the cross of Jesus, even if that was the place where he paid for your sins. But you don't want just the cross of Jesus. Is the life of Jesus less important because of the cross? No. It has another purpose, but it's connected. The one who is dying at the cross is organically connected. The one born in Bethlehem, it is important. It's, you cannot have the cross without Beth, Bethlehem. You cannot have the life of Jesus without Bethlehem. You cannot have, you know, whatever the life is also depends much on what he did on the cross and the resurrection. So, and N.T. Wright mentioned this in the book that you are about to read. We need to be careful with certain um, things that sometimes we say, the life of Jesus take us out of hell, you know, or the death of Jesus or the work of Jesus to take us to heaven. By the way, that terminology, he says, is not biblically based. Emphasizing that you go to heaven is not actually what the Bible tells us about. You will see that, and don't, don't blame it on me, okay? You will see it there in, he will even call it pagan. This is paganism immersed in Christianity. What the scriptures, all in New Testament, tell us is new earth, new heavens. Uh, uh, we are not angels that we're going to be living in heaven forever. You know, some versions of, uh, of dispensationalist theologians were the idea that the eternal state is in heaven, you know, completely. You know that. And so he says, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And I think he is right. When you read the prophets, when you read even Jesus and the apostles, it tells you that, ah. And so uh, even if you have to have some emphasis on certain things, I think my way of doing it is, is to put it in a holistic way. You know, you see, yes, the cross uh, has a purpose, a defined purpose, but you cannot just disconnect it with the others. In Jesus, you have salvation from hell, yes, salvation for the kingdom of God or the new earth and the new heavens. See, you have in Jesus, you have this connection, intimate connection with God that is enjoyable. That it, today. Right now, even, even if not complete, um, salvation is about uh, having so many other things, justification, which, by the way, is a problematic term for, for N.T. Wright that I am not sure where to stand right now because he has some very good insights there. But on the other hand, if he's completely right there, if right is right, we are in trouble in that particular thing. So keep reading him, because one thing you cannot deny about this guy, and that he knows his stuff from all, from first century, first, uh, second 
Second Temple Literature and Time. You remember that terminology, don't you? Okay. So, how are we, guys? Do we have uh, any question? You know, any, many questions. <laughs> well, only about this class. Questions about only this class. What are you eating? That's my first question for you. Tomato again? Tomato? Wow. They say tomato is good for prostrate, uh, prostate. <laughs> I want to start a, a little question based on what you just mentioned. I was, um, I was reading about criticism that right received. Why read? Oh. Some people saying that he is not necessarily balancing um, the. Uh, um, criticizing him and there's a there's a back and forth between the two of them I don't know if, if you could um, right. talk a little bit about that sure I think there's um, what he points out is that the way we have traditionally or a lot of believers have traditionally understood uh, penal substitution is not how vicarious substitution is presented in the scripture. And he goes to give you into details, giving you in this book that you're going to read, he will give you enough material for that, um, telling you why the, why have we, why we have separated uh, the whole event of the cross from the context of Jesus' life and from the context of the story of Israel and how it makes sense much better if you take into account everything that comes before the cross in terms of what is the meaning of Jesus taking my place? What is the meaning of Jesus suffering instead of me? that isolating that and saying that Jesus was suffering because he needed to appease an angry God. An angry God. So at the end of the day, I suggest to you that what he is trying to teach us is that there are different ways of understanding vicarious substitution or vicarious um, how would you say? You know, the, word we, the, the way we say it is penal substitution. What do you mean by penal substitution? You know, substitu substitution is there. Jesus took our place. Why did he do it? Was it because God was angry, angry at us? Uh, or was it because of something else? And beyond that, what is the role of the Father, again, at the cross? That's why I've been emphasizing this. And before telling you goodbye, let me show you quickly here. Hold on. Come on. Well, while you share that, uh, may I read a quote from him that made um, a difference for me? Because I, I was reading about it, and some people... Mm -hmm. And justly stating that he was not for the penal part um, of the penal substitutionary atonement. Right. He was. It was. It was in, in some way denying uh, the the penalty that he carried on his back. Um, I found this quote from uh, the New Dictionary of Theology by him, mm -hmm. where he says Jesus would carry out Israel's task, mm -hmm. had pronounced Israel's impending judgment in the form of the wrath of Rome, which would turn out to be the wrath of God. 
he would go ahead of her and take that judgment on himself, mm -hmm. drinking the cup of the of God's wrath, mm -hmm. so that his people might not drink it. In his crucifixion, therefore, Jesus identified fully, if paradox, paradoxically, with the aspirations of his people, right. dying as the king of the Jews, the representative of the people of God, accomplishing for Israel, and hence the world, what either the world or Israel could accomplish for, for themselves. Right. 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 Um, yeah, and I think, you know, I I need to do several things, and so I don't know what to do. Uh, I want to I wanted to show you this type of pictures. What I can share so that you can see it. Uh, Where? Share it. Share it. Um, and so. How do you picture God? This is this was my question. If by penal substitution you you include a God who is punishing literally Jesus at the cross, there's something wrong with it. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that Jesus is not taking over him the wrath of God, like like the quotation that he had. Check this, guys, and with this I, I leave you. We, we can have more time later on to speak about this. Uh, when in the Old Testament, the wrath of God is promised to Israel because of, his, of their sin, how is that wrath of God manifested? Was God himself um, punishing them for their sinfulness? Or was it that God allowed Babylon to come and take them to exile and do all those horrible things to Israel and Jerusalem and the temple and everything else? And that being the wrath of God. However, however, he, you know, if you, you don't you don't want to picture, paint God, you know, whipping or angry. This way, but allowing, allowing this to take place, permitting this to take place, and sometimes even planning this to take place as a punishment for the sin of Israel. Why is it, and here's a question for you to think, why is it that it's so difficult for us to understand that the wrath of God and be the cross itself where God actually is permitting allowing those who crucified Jesus to cause him all this pain and he being who he is suffering extreme extremely like you know again uh, because of who he is suffering this and identifying that cross itself as the wrath of God not because God is mad at him, not because God is, you know, doing this at him, but because God and him and the Holy Spirit decided in consensus, Trinitarian, you know, that this will take place instead of people going into the same situation. Are you following what I'm saying? The image that we have of God should be something more like this. It's check check this. What face is this? Huh? This is only one. Check check this. I Caucasian. Huh? <laughs> My goodness, Victor. Easy guy. One one thing at a time, you know. Do you you want to go? Okay, see this picture of Rafael. Rafael is a, is a great painter, uh, was a great painter. On the, did I hit? Yeah, it's sharing. Sharing? Yes. Um, no, but this is not the one. I wanted to show you the, the other one. The one by Rafael. Where is it? Time is up, guys. 
See, this is Spain, medieval times. See Jesus dying. Again, the Holy Ghost here. And check again God doing this. Mm. I mean, imagery changes the way we, we think, honestly. Let me show you so another one. I have many here. This is on a sculpture. How do you like that one? Glory Patri, El Hijo y el Espíritu Santo. Check again the face of God. The face that you're able to see and how he's holding Jesus there again. This is new invention. This is not a new invention. This is something that has been neglected by some, some theologians, I believe. Check this again. This is very old. Stop sharing and share again, but I can do it again. Stop sharing. Here again. Here. Yeah. So, see, here God is more depicted like an emperor, but he is again, if we can go closer there, you can see the suffering God. Another one, just to finish, they have like I don't know, 20 here? Sure. This one is uh, it's sharing? Yes, it did just before, so share now. Share now? Where do I share? Uh, from Zoom. This is a complete mess, guys. Yeah, let's share now. <laughs> okay. Take the last one here. I have like 10 or 12 of those pictures. The hands. And how this goes more with the offering. God is offering his son for us. And in a sense, to us. Okay, this is what I give you. This is more 316 of John. You know? I'm giving you this. Yes, sir. Is this medieval imagery? Most of them are. Most of them are. And uh, some are even um, early church. The telos. The, um, let me see. The trinity here. The, this, is, this is the only one that I found a little, uh, you know, different. Because on the one hand, God the Father is holding the cross, but at the same time, you can see his face. It's a little mad, isn't Two more and we're done. How do you like this? I call it pericoresis, right? There's no way for us to separate this. They're always together, even if different there. I like it, by the way. I wish I could use that for the title of, a, uh, I mean, for the cover of a book. Check that. Cross the spirit, God. God bless you. Think about this.